Lord, we thank you for your great wisdom manifested to us in the person of Jesus Christ. And we pray we might come away with some better possession of his spirit, peace and faith and the will to live accordingly. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. So here then is the last section of the Upper Room Discourse about the going away of Jesus and what it must mean for the disciples, that ultimately it is for their good. He was about to be arrested at Gethsemane. It was now late at night after the Last Supper and the Son of Man was going to be crucified for the sins of the world. But through what happens to him, they will be blessed, receiving the Holy Spirit and the peace of Christ, the grace to believe, and so far from mourning, they should rejoice when Jesus is back with the Father. So we'll look at the passage in terms of these parting gifts of Christ. First, the gift of the Holy Spirit, verse 25, 26. And second, the peace of Jesus Christ, verse 27 to 28. And third, the grace to believe in spite of evil, verse 29 to 31. So let's first look then at the gift of the Holy Spirit mentioned in verse 25 and 26. All this I have spoken while still with you, but the Counselor, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. So Jesus continues in his consolation speech to the disciples in verse 25. This is before he goes to the cross. He has spoken all this to them to minimize their suffering and confusion when the time came. They being what they were, it might only have a limited effect at the time, but it was like sowing a seed, which even if not made much of at the point of delivery, or even at the point of crisis, would finally come to fruition as they looked back after events and saw them in a new light. And it has to be said that listening to preaching or reading the Bible can be very like that. You might not appreciate what's being said or read today at all, but it might grab you later. And that's one of the reasons we keep laboring on anyway, in spite of some protests, and we keep reading the word, all of it, trying to get it out into people's hearing it doesn't have to be immediately obvious what you get from it. Yet though the heavens and earth pass away, his words will not. Jesus has said these words while still with them. They will fondly remember these moments and go over and over his words. And guess what? Gain yet more from them that they hadn't picked up at first. Remain in his words. Don't go looking elsewhere if at first they don't seem to satisfy. The seed has been planted. Keep coming back to it. We need to wait, as the disciples had to, for the Counselor, the Holy Spirit, verse 26, to illuminate his words. And again, we meet with that word paraclete, our advocate or counsel for the defense. He is another counselor. Verse 16, Christ being the first. And like Christ, he pleads his people's cause before the Father. This person is in Christ. Their sins are already dealt with by his saving work. The Spirit provides the assistance we need to overcome difficulty, the assurance we need to combat doubts. And this indwelling of the Spirit is how the Father and the Son will make their abode with the believer, we saw in verse 23. The Holy Spirit is the spirit of holiness. That is his personal character, and it should be reflected in ours. He is sent by both the Father and the Son. In chapter 15, 26, it's the other way around, isn't it? When the Counselor comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of Truth, who goes out from the Father, he will testify about me. So, the Spirit continues the work of Christ on earth, representing him through his indwelt people. But in this work, in this verse, the Spirit is introduced as a teacher, 
a teacher who brings to their minds all that they need to know. He is the guide of the church into all truth, all that Jesus has taught and commanded, emphasizing what needs to be highlighted for each individual believer with his or her limitations or prejudices or overcompensations. We all need slightly different nuances, and he gives us that. The disciples were criticized later for learning so little. Uh, Luke 24, 25 to 26, then he said unto them, O fools, and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not Christ to have suffered these things and to enter his glory? You see, pride can get in the way. If, if this is not what we're used to hearing, or this is not the sense or the interpretation that we're familiar with, but the Holy Spirit, the Counselor, makes up for what we lack. He is the Spirit of Christ sent by the Father in the name of Jesus, that is, with his full authority to teach them all things and even remind them of everything he had said to them. His teaching is no different. And this explains how John was able to write it down in so much detail decades later. I admit the apostles were unique in their gifting and authority, but to a lesser extent, this also applies to the priesthood of all believers. One of the things the Holy Spirit gives to Christians is a teachable heart, so that even if we've built up over the years a solid foundation of what scripture means and how it applies to us, we can always learn more. Even with discernment from someone outside our tradition, or someone relatively inexperienced. But to cultivate this requires attentiveness, but also patience for the Spirit to make things clear. Maybe not now, but later. For a time to humble us, he may not reveal certain things, but there is nothing in Scripture we should reject. And when it comes to secondary literature or preaching, there's no need to be dismissive because it isn't exactly the Bible. We need many things explained to us, and certain people, alive or in history, are recommended with discernment in providing that help. The Holy Spirit can work through these resources also, just as when uh, John Wesley was converted through someone reading out Luther's introduction to Romans, and his subsequent sermons were used to win thousands, flawed though they were, some of them. Um, and then, did you ever hear of a man called Edmund Bunny? This is something I, I just found on my phone this morning, if I've still got it. Edmund Bunny, 1540 to 1619, wrote a book called Resolution. And it's recorded here that Bunny's resolution roused Richard Baxter to concern, and Richard Sibbs's bruised reed led him to the Saviour. Baxter then wrote The Cult of the Unconverted, which was blessed to Philip Doddridge, who afterwards wrote The Rise and Progress of Religion in the Soul. This book gave the first religious impressions to William Wilberforce, then MP for the County of York, who produced The Practical View of Christianity, which was blessed to Lady Colquhoun, whose Christian efforts are recorded in her biography by Reverend Dr. Hamilton. It was also blessed to the Reverend Leigh Richmond, who in his turn wrote The Dairyman's Daughter and Young Cottager, which have been the means of saving many souls. The practical view was further instrumental in bringing Thomas Chalmers to knowledge of the truth. And who can estimate the, effect, the effects of his eloquence and the worth of his books, and so on, and so on, down a chain. Don't tell the counsellor what he can and can't do or use. He is the great suggester of divine, true ideas to our minds, based on the inspired word and its interpretation. That is to say, there is no new revelation apart from what the Bible contains, but the way it connects up, the way it's explained and applied to new times can give us the new insights that we need. Now, there are indeed deceiving spirits in the world suggesting false teachings, and we should beware of them. So how do we tell the difference? By having scripture itself as our norming norm, the final authority by which we judge them. The Holy Spirit will not reveal anything contrary to the plain teaching of the Bible. But we need to move on, secondly, to the peace of Jesus Christ. Verse 27 to 28. 
Peace I leave with you, my peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. You heard me say I am going away and I am coming back to you. If you loved me, you would be glad that I am going to the Father, for the Father is greater than I. So Jesus would leave with his disciples another gift, that of his peace. Verse 27. Now peace, as understood in the Bible, is not so much a lack of war as a dynamic harmony of well-being in the life of the believer. It's a peace that doesn't depend on earthly circumstances. The world cannot understand it, let alone give it. How can you be so at peace, despite being stuck in that situation for so long? It's a gift of God through being in Christ. Now, Jewish people back then, and still today, they often use shalom as a greeting to say hello or goodbye. Did you know that goodbye in English is contracted from God be with you? There's more to the definition of the word than a mere greeting or farewell. The peace enjoyed by the Christian is transcendent. It's proof against being embittered by the state of the world or the church. We can be very prone today to the stance that psychologists call ain't it awful, infusing all our conversation with negativity. Yes, of course it's awful, but where's your joy? Where's your peace? He has blessed us with his spirit. And so we are enabled, we are empowered to not let our hearts be troubled and to not be afraid. If we love him, we'll keep those commandments too. Christ may not be bodily with us, but he is indeed with us through the Spirit. In him we may overcome the appetites and disappointments of the flesh. In him we may easily reject the counterfeit because we know the real thing. Peace, of course, is one of the fruit of the Holy Spirit in Galatians 5, 22 to 23. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. So this peace, Jesus would leave behind him like a bequest in a will. Uh, 2 Thessalonians 3, 16, Now the Lord of peace himself give you peace always by all means. The Lord be with you all. And Jesus repeats the word. Uh, peace for emphasis. This is no ordinary peace. The world may hope for peace and desire it, but it cannot give it. Wars may cease temporarily. Settlements be negotiated, but then very quickly conflict springs up again. The peace of Jesus Christ is far superior to any concept that man has of it. It is his gift to us wherewith we genuinely can overcome trouble of heart and fear. It is the evidence of a right relationship with God. And he reminds them again, Jesus now with the disciples, once again, he's going away, verse 28, but he's coming back to them. And given what he's already said about asking the Father to send the Spirit, if they love him, they should be glad that he's going to the Father to procure such a helper for them. And indeed, they did love him, but not always as they should have, or according to knowledge. Their love for him, like ours often is, was sinfully deficient. Full of human affection, but not so much of the spiritual or practical, or understanding what it would really mean to love him. So Jesus is he's gently rebuking his disciples for their consternation at his going away. They should be full of love and rejoicing, because he's trying to tell them what it's going to mean. They can't really get their heads around that yet. But nevertheless, they, they, they should be encouraged by what he promises them is coming. When he says, the Father is greater than I, is that just his human nature speaking? Because surely the Son is equal to the Father. But he descended to this world to mediate between us and God. It's in terms of his mission as the one sent to die as the just 
for the unjust to bring us to God. Uh, 1 Corinthians 15, 24, then the end will come. Christ will hand over the kingdom to God the Father as he destroys every ruler, authority and power. We spoke about there being a, an order within the Godhead, within the Trinity, in spite of their absolute co-equality of the persons. Jesus Christ is God manifested in the flesh. He was humbled on the earth. But when we see him in glory, we'll see him as he truly is. That is a distinction to be made here. The Father, as observed in heaven, is greater than his express image as manifested on earth. On his ascension, the Son entered into a glory and power not seen below. It is better for his disciples then, and better for us, that he has done so. The heavenly session is greater, so to speak, than the incarnation. Jesus, Son of God, uncreated, became voluntarily subordinate to the Father while on earth. Yet at the same time, John 10.30, I and the Father are one. Only God can compare himself with God and say the Father is greater than I. Jesus is excited to be going home. Hebrews 12.2, looking to the author and perfecter of the faith, Jesus, who for the joy set before him, endured a cross having despised the shame and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. You get the feeling he could hardly wait. Why couldn't they see it his way? Well, thirdly, the grace to believe in spite of evil. Verse 29 to 31. I have told you now before it happens so that when it does happen, you will believe. I will not speak with you much longer for the prince of this world is coming. He has no hold on me, but the world must learn that I love the Father and that I do exactly what the Father has commanded me. Come now, let us leave. So Jesus has now told his disciples many times about the things pertaining to his death and resurrection. Verse 29, things that are foolishness to those who are perishing and only divinely communicable. But having told them, it would make all the difference to the faith of these disciples when those events did take place. At the time of being told about them, they did not really understand. But if they treasured them up in their hearts anyway, they would and would believe when the time came. His words would have a greater effect in the future when they were fulfilled. Then they would trust more fully in him for that eternal life that he had promised. So that's the disciples. What about us? Do we believe? We've got the whole gospel in hand. We, we can read not only the predictions, but their fulfillment. Can we grasp that Jesus has died for our sin and has risen from death in defeat of it and ascended to the Father, pouring out the Spirit, Praying for his people. Can you see how secure your hope is if you accept Christ as your Lord and Saviour? Well, those events were coming on fast. Verse 30, time was short. They must now or never take on board what he's had to say. But like all people, they can only take in so much. Our minds are limited. And on top of that, they're, they're blurred by sin, not like his. But when we feel the urgency of the matter, we seek a bit harder, don't we, to grasp what we can of a subject. There was no time to lose here. The prince of this world, that is Satan, was coming. Jesus warns them. His agents, Judas Iscariot, and a troop of soldiers might have been just starting out. Christ would soon be killed. But that wasn't the end. At the cross, the prince of the, this world would do his worst, or so he thought but would in fact be defeated. In John 12, 31 to 32, now judgment is upon this world. Now the prince of this world will be cast out. And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw everyone to myself. Neither death nor Satan had any hold on him. There is no foothold in Christ that the devil can get onto. His friends would be shocked to see him crucified. 
but his subjection to death would be voluntary and only temporary in obedience to the Father. The devil exercises power as the prince of this world only with God's permission. But it's quite a broad permission. He is allowed control of all those who do not belong to Christ, those not regenerated by the Holy Spirit. That's quite a majority in this world. And they willingly serve him. They, they do his work, not just by Adam's first sin, but with all their own. And if nothing changes, they are heading for hell. But Christ teaches us to hate our sin, to rebel against Satan, and to have him, Jesus, as our living head instead of Adam. The devil has nothing in Jesus Christ. In fact, the devil cannot even repent. He is bound for hell. And he couldn't tempt Jesus to sin, not even once. Christ is sinlessly pure, even in his human nature. But he also has divine power. He was in control of things the whole time. He had authority to lay down his life and authority to take it up again. And all on our behalf and to the glory of God. All that Jesus did was in obedience to the Father and love for the Father. Verse 31. This is what the world, or at least all believers, must learn and spread the good news. That God appointed his Son to suffer on the cross to reconcile a people to himself by taking on himself and having punished in him the sins of the world. Christ's love and obedience to the Father was total, and that included, of course, his death for sinners. What, what better demonstration of love and obedience could he make to the world, or at least to those with eyes to see? And God was quite prepared to use Satan in that process, as far as it went. But the upshot of it all was Satan's defeat and our salvation to the praise of God's glory. Christ obeyed the Father perfectly, that we might be forgiven where we have not. And that is the end of the Upper Room Discourse. Our Lord's next words are, come now, let us leave. He bids them all to go out with him and meet the enemy. So they made their way slowly down to the Kidron Valley, with Jesus still teaching his disciples all the way and praying. The nights were warm and fragrant, pleasant to be out in, and they were heading eventually for the Garden of Gethsemane. And we hope that the disciples' thirst for knowledge of him, and more knowledge, awakened by what he had said to them, made them all the more attentive to him. And may it be so for us too. Now most of us know the behaviour of the Covid virus because it seemed a few years ago to be knowledge very necessary to have. If you're revising for an exam or a driving test, you cram as much as you can in a short space. That's human nature. It's a means to an end. What about life's greatest exam? If you knew you were going to die tomorrow, would you be sure of heaven? Would you know where to go in the Bible to find that hope? Would all those past sermons and decent books come to mind with a new seriousness? Well, let me make it easier. You need only repent of sin, believe in Jesus as the Son of God and our sin bearer, our sacrificial lamb, our substitute on the cross, and all our sins are dealt with by his blood. And we may be sure of heaven. Let's pray. Father, we're speechless at what your son suffered to redeem us from your wrath. We ask for your help to respond to these things in the right way, not in tragic sympathy as if he were a helpless victim, but in love and gratitude for those willing sufferings in our stead. Send the counsellor, the Holy Spirit, that we might abound in praise and worship for the Lord Jesus Christ who died for us to take away our sin and our trouble of heart and fear and make us whole in your sight. Help us who have been healed by his stripes to testify to what you've done in our lives, 
to the peace that we have received and live solely for your glory, enduring whatever reproach the world throws at us for his sake and help those who still need to come to you to tarry no longer. Call us to yourself, we pray, and give us confidence in your power to heal and to save. In Jesus' name, amen.